All right. Thank you so much. Welcome to another episode of the Love, Hope, Lime podcast. My name is Fred Diamond. I'm the author of Love, Hope, Lime, what family members, partners, and friends who love a chronic Lyme survivor need to know. You can find this podcast, of course, on Apple Podcasts. If you're listening there, please go up, give a five-star review. I'd appreciate it. If you're watching on YouTube, thank you very much. Go to this episode, leave a comment, give a thumbs up. Let people know about it. I'm the author, again, as I mentioned, of Love, Hope, Lyme with family members, partners, and friends who love a chronic Lyme survivor, Dorothy and Rachel, as you both know. The e-version of that book is always free for chronic Lyme survivors. It's been free from day one. It will be free uh, for forever. And uh, all you have to do is just reach out to me on either Facebook Messenger or LinkedIn. I spent a lot of time on LinkedIn and I'd be happy to send it to you, Dorothy. I've sent out over a thousand copies, the e-version of Love, Hope, Lime. I also uh, compliment every Love, Hope, Lime podcast or, or the vast majority of them with an article on LymeDisease.org. So I'm thrilled today. We're talking to the president of LymeDisease.org, Dorothy Leland and her daughter, Rachel Leland. They're both the authors of Finding Resilience, a Teen's Journey Through Lyme Disease. I read the book. It's great. It's vulnerable. It's authentic. It's also well-written. So congratulations, uh, Rachel and Dorothy, on making the book available. So Rachel, uh, why don't you get us started here? Uh, it's great to see you both. Give, me, uh, give us an overview of your Lyme journey. Okay. So hello. Um, <laughs> I... Uh, our Lyme journey started when I was 13 years old, and I had been a year-round competitive soccer player, and I've been doing that since I was young. Um, and then one day, I fell and I sprained my wrist. And leading up to this, I'd been having knee pain for a few years, but it hadn't really stopped me from playing. It had just been sort of in the background. But when I fell and I sprained my wrist, we found that in a couple of weeks, I was just in body-wide pain, not just my wrist, but everywhere. And so in a couple of weeks, I was using crutches because my feet and my knees hurt too much. And then a couple of weeks later, I was in a wheelchair mm -hmm. and we were very surprised because I had fallen on a soccer game on my wrist. Um, and that sort of catapulted us into going to all of these doctors, trying to figure out what was going on. And it took nine months until we finally got the diagnosis of Lyme disease after having gone to many, many doctors who had no idea what it was. Um, and so it turns out that when I had fallen on my wrist, I'd already had Lyme and it had just kind of been like ruminating. And when I hurt my wrist, my body just sort of took that moment of stress and was like, we're just going to run with it. Um, so then I, we finally found a Lyme literate doctor, worked with him. And the next few years was a whole roller coaster of going up and down, trying to trying to heal. So, give us some logistical background. Where where were you? What part of the country was this? And then, uh, Dorothy, what kind of doctors? I mean, Rachel mentioned you had seen a bunch of doctors before you saw your Lyme literate medical doctor. So, Rachel, what part of the country was this? And then, Dorothy, tell uh, us about the doctors. Northern California. Okay. Yeah, Northern California. Okay. So, Dorothy, what kind of doctors did you see uh, to get to this? Eventually, get the diagnosis. Well, we started uh, with the primary care and uh, and were referred to uh, rheumatologists and um, the various other people. We had lots of tests. We had lots of scans. Um, there was a pain doctor in there somewhere. There was uh, there was lots of stuff. Uh, she actually ended up in a children's hospital with uh, that had a pediatric pain unit that um, we thought, oh, finally, they'll get to the answer. And uh, their answer was that it was, there was nothing physically wrong with her, that it mm. was all um, emotional. And that just didn't ring true for us. And we, we kept, you know, kept slogging along. And actually the way I, I finally got to a, a doctor via the what was at that time a Yahoo group for the called California Lyme, mm. and uh, and then they you know they don't name doctors in the groups, but you make a connection and you find out about a doctor, and and we finally got to a doctor and also also in Northern California, and it was about two hours from our home. But there's people that we found had to be, you know, had to go to different states to get to somebody that could help them. So um, 
I lost track. Was there something, another part? Well, I, have, of no, I, have a, I have a quick question for you. So you mentioned that you had found a community on Yahoo. And mm -hmm. uh, when I started doing the research for Love, Hope, Lime, I met thousands of people on Facebook in Facebook groups. And when I typed in Lime into Facebook, I was shocked to find like a thousand groups, some with tens of thousands of people. Subsequently, I found groups on Instagram. I've even found a group on Reddit which had led me to someone who's become a great friend of mine was, was Yahoo and what we used to call listservs was, was that how right. you had to find the connection? Facebook back didn't then? exist. They, Facebook didn't exist at that time. Uh, it was, um, she, you know, she initially had the fall and everything in 2005, which um, I believe Mark Zuckerberg was still in college trying mm. to meet girls online. <laughs> <laughs> so there was uh, there was Yahoo Yahoo had a variety of groups. There was something called uh, LimeNet, which was a list serve, which I is is still in in uh, business. But I mean, it wasn't. It was it was the only. <laughs> it was one of the few things around. There weren't any books. There weren't uh, or darn darn few of them. <laughs> and you just even even the websites of um, organizations like the one that I'm now involved with didn't have much information. And so what I really found out, the most helpful information was from other people in the same situation in a support group. And since that time, as you know, there's now it has really exploded. There are a lot of groups around, and um, some of them now the, the the challenge is to sift through all the information and and figure out what's 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 helpful. Before it was you were just looking at a vast nothing. So, yeah, you know, I just want to remind people too. You, yeah, you were actually by by yourself. You were actually a guest on the second episode of the Love Hope Line podcast. So if you're listening to this on Apple or if you're watching on YouTube, go back to the uh, to the main playlist and you'll find my interview with Dorothy talking about her specific journey as well. Rachel, when this was beginning, you started to journal. So tell us about that. Why did you, what prompted you? Again, you were a teenage girl at the time. So I guess we used to call uh, Dorothy Journal's diaries back in the day. But, uh, you know, you started to write about what was going on. Tell us what prompted you to do that and, and give us some more insights into why and how that helped you. Yeah, so actually very shortly after I went into the wheelchair, I mean, we had no idea what was going on, but my mom had the suggestion. She said, why don't you just start keeping a journal? We called it a journal in my house. And, um, and so why don't you keep a journal? And I had recently read the diary of Anne Frank and Zada's diary. And so I thought that was kind of a cool thing to do. So it was not just so much that my mom suggested it. She, she helped, but then I thought, you know, other cool people did it so I could do it too. And so then I started out, we just, you know, got a notebook around the house and I just, I uh, started that way. And then it became just so much more than just kind of, you know, me just telling my thoughts. Like it was so important for me to be able to document what was going on when, when no one knew what was going on and when no one, most people weren't believing, especially in the medical community, they weren't believing what I was saying. So it was really important for me for years. I kept that throughout my entire time in the wheelchair and a little bit after uh, it was so important for me to be able to get my story down and to make sure that, you know, I was heard, even if it was just in my journal. Yeah. Just curiously, how many journals did you like a dozen, 20, 50, how many did you wind up with? Well, I started out, I ended up having two physical ones. I filled up one notebook and then I got another notebook. And then by that point, my hand, I don't have the best handwriting and it was always like cramping up. And so then I went digital, but I had, I copied over everything from the first two journals into my um, word document and it ended up being over 500 pages. Wow. At the end. Oh, good for you. Yeah. So Dorothy, uh, one thing that I've learned when I started doing the research on Lyme disease was how many people are in your situation, a mother with a teenage daughter, and some have become amazing friends. And it's, it's just a harrowing experience. Give us your perspective on what was happening at the time. Well, uh, my perspective was is that I didn't know what was happening at the time. You know, my daughter had always been, um, you know, in pretty good shape and athletic and, you know, liked to climb trees and, uh, you know, that, that, that kind of a world. And suddenly she wasn't. 
And we would go to the doctor and our experience up to that time was you went to the doctor and they helped you. <laughs> and so we went to the doctor and and we'd suddenly, you know, suddenly it wasn't, you know, one of the 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 real turning points that that I noticed was that when we had an MR, her wrist was still really hurting her. And they had an X-ray that didn't show anything wrong with it. And they had an MRI of the wrist and went, you know, you have to wait, you get a referral, blah, blah, blah. It was sometime down the road. When they got the MRI of the wrist, they came back and they said, there's nothing wrong with it. Oh, their whole view changed. Suddenly, oh, oh, it's not real. She's not really sick. And that really, it, it's like, I mean, my child was in intense pain and was losing it psychologically because she was in intense pain all the time and nothing helped. And we gave a bunch of different medications and whatever, and nothing helped. And suddenly the doctors were telling us this stuff that was, they were saying that there wasn't anything wrong with her. And it was just, and, you know, she was starting to have what I suppose were kind of like panic attacks sometimes or kind of, you know, like not being able to get her breath. And it was just like, it, it, it you know, it was, it was, it was just awful. It was just awful. And somebody said to us, a neighbor actually said, you know, do you think it could be Lyme disease? And I could just because they had known somebody in a similar situation and it had turned out to be Lyme disease. And I was like, great, you know, I'll go Google that. And the stuff that I saw online, eh, you know, didn't really seem persuasive one way or the other. But I asked the rheumatologist that we were seeing at the time, and he practically threw us out of the office. It was like, this isn't Lyme disease. There's no Lyme disease around here. And I said, well, you know, we don't spend all our time here. We travel, we go other places, we hike, we camp. You know, I was a Girl Scout leader for, for Rachel's Girl Scout troop. We'd, you know, we'd, we'd been out in the bushes and uh, it was, it was very weird. I knew nothing about that. And it was, it was a situation where you'd, you'd be talking to a doctor or something. And it was like, you want to see them melt down, say the word slime disease. <laughs> so we'll, just, we'll, they, we'll, get, we'll get back to this in a second, but Rachel, I've, I've got another question for you. People, not everybody knows that, uh, well, first of all, Lyme of course is a tick-borne illness in the vast majority of the cases. Um, and, uh, not only does a tick transmit Lyme disease, but it can transmit, I've heard two, or sometimes two to three dozen other what they call co-infections. Uh, before I ask you about how this disrupted your teenage years, what were you diagnosed with besides Lyme disease? Were there other co-infections that eventually you were diagnosed with? Yeah, so it was Lyme disease, Bartonella, and Babesia, which as you know, then you're not just treating one disease, you're treating a bunch of diseases, which some of the treatment overlaps, some of it doesn't. So. Yeah, so we were treating all three of those for many years. Did the diagnosis come at one time? Oh, you have these three, or was it you have Lyme, and then a year later, Barnell? Tell us the chronology of how the diagnosis came to those three. Yeah, I think the first one was Lyme, and then we did various tests over the next, I don't even know whether it was months or however long, and then it was like, oh, you know what? You got Bartonella, you got Babesia, and then... Yeah. So I don't even know exactly how, how, I mean, our life was melting down at that point. So I don't really know the timeline, but it was yeah. not all at once. It was not one little pretty picture that we knew. Yeah. They do different things or treated differently. One's a, you know, bacteria, parasite, you know, it's, it's all those things. Tell us about your teenage years. So again, you started journaling all of a sudden you were an athlete, you were playing sports, you know, you're now in a wheelchair, you have this pain all the time. Your family's going through this, uh, this uh, experience together, which has caused all types of, of issues. Give us some insights for the people listening to the Love, Hope, Lime podcast on how you were feeling going through this. Um, I mean, it was just, it was, it, it felt just very unstable. I, I had no idea what was happening. No idea, even after the Lyme diagnosis. I mean, I got the diagnosis. I started antibiotics and then I hit like 
10,000 feet below rock bottom that we didn't even know was possible. And then it just seemed to just keep getting worse. And so at this point I was out of school. I was in eighth grade. I had been in eighth grade. I was way too sick. I had, we rented a hospital bed, um, which was in my room. So I spent 24 seven in my hospital bed. I could not lay flat or sit up straight due to intense back pain and breathing problems. So I needed to be at a reclined angle with my legs up and my back reclined. And that was the only place that I was even remotely okay, not even comfortable, but just okay enough to be able to breathe. And so my entire life became in my bedroom, not even in the kitchen, not the living room, in my bedroom, in my hospital bed. And so that was, uh, that that just kind of became our, became my, my teenagers. And I was extremely lucky that we lived in an amazing community and I had a lot of friends that I had grown up with. And so I know a lot of people do not have the same experience as I had, but all of my friends that I lived next to, they stood by me. They would come over, sit by my bed. We'd play Nintendo games, play on the computer. And um, and they just, they'd go off to school. And then after school, they would come and they'd see me for a little bit and on the weekends. And that was extremely important. So did they know that you had this disease, this mysterious disease called Lyme? Did they want to know more about it? Or did they just know you know, Rachel is has some type of disease or sickness and we love her. We're friends. She's a great gal. We're just going to hang out with her. Yeah. They all knew that I had Lyme and we got in the Lyme disease.org Lyme bracelets that were green. My favorite color had always been Lyme green well before Lyme disease. <laughs> so it just worked out. And so we got like all of my friends had the Lyme bracelet. So they knew about it, but I mean, it was just kind of it was normal. It wasn't something we usually talked about. In fact, after the fact, after I've written this memoir with my mom, all of them have been reaching out, especially because a lot of them are in it. And so they all knew, but they were reaching out just saying they had absolutely no idea just like how bad it was because they would come over and we wouldn't really talk about it. And we'd play our games, watch our TV shows, just kind of, you know, do more kids stuff. And then they would leave and then everything else we'd deal with. And yeah. then she got down. <laughs> yeah, then I'm unfortunately <laughs> something that happened a lot. She, it, it was it was interesting, and I think we mentioned this in the book. It's like somehow she could hold it together when her friends were around, and then they'd leave, and it was like it would all fall apart, and there would be you know crying and angst, and you know sometimes pounding the wall. And it was just, it, so it was really uh, those young ladies, you know, they're all, they're all adults now, <laughs> but those, those girls were really an important part of the team <laughs> in terms of, of our getting through this. Wow. That's amazing. I'm just kind of curious. Did you, how deep Rachel, did you get with like your real close friends about what were you going through or were you kind of talking about normal things, you know? movies and boys and whatever it is you might be talking about back then and you had Lyme or were you intimate with your closest friends about the pains that you're going through and the struggles and we're going to talk about some of your bouts with depression as well but how were those conversations with your friends yeah I had one friend who I was I she knew that I was really depressed and and we talked about that a little bit more but again for the most part we, my friends were my escape. And so I didn't want to talk about that. So, I mean, most of them really didn't know. And I didn't show my, you know, hand of cards, whatever that phrase is. I didn't show my <laughs> hand. And then, um, and I mean, we loved to film videos. That was a huge thing my friends and I did. And that was something we could do from my bed. And um, so that's usually most of what we did. So we mostly didn't talk about it. Very good. Dorothy, you also wrote a great book a few years ago, Advising Parents on how to support your child with Lyme. Again, we're talking with Dorothy Leland and Rachel Leland, the authors of Finding Resilience, a Teen's Journey Through Lyme Disease. As a little bit of a twist, Dorothy, your first book uh, was actually co-authored by the aunt of one of my best friends growing up, Michael Bierenbaum, the author, your co-author, of course, was Sandra Bierenbaum, which was a this one of these Lyme world type of things that, that come together, if you will. As a parent, talk about the school experience you know how did the schools treat your daughter how did they treat her what was your response you know obviously uh you know rachel's uh, an intelligent girl what did you have to do to get her educated and what was your interaction with like the uh the official school system well yes there was uh several chapters in that original <laughs> book when your child has lyme disease a parent survival guide 
uh, several chapters are are devoted to school related issues because that's an important thing, you know, with our kids. And now there's all of these, you know, there there are remote possibilities mm -hmm. of doing things in online schools and whatever. This was just beginning to happen at that time that there mm -hmm. were some online school things, but they 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 weren't they weren't great. Uh, the first issue was is that it was Rachel was Rachel actually went to the school uh, went to school the first half of her eighth grade year, uh, and then we got the the Lyme diagnosis and started the treatment and she started herxing and was really miserable and never continued anymore for the eighth grade the rest of the eighth grade year. And the schools um, are, they're very sympathetic when they find out your child is sick and they say, okay, here's your options. And one of them was the one that we tried and it didn't work out very well was that they would send a teacher to the house to work with her. Hmm. And, but it's an, it's an actual appointment like it, ours was at nine o'clock on, you know, whatever Wednesdays or something. And Rachel was at a place where she was not sleeping well. And so she would be up literally all night and then fall asleep at 7.30 in the morning. <laughs> and I was not going to wake her up for a teacher at nine o'clock to come try to talk about math. And so uh, it's just they the, the school got mad at me because I canceled some things. And they finally just said that this won't work. And I, you know, we had letters from the doctor or whatever, but it was just, we just kind of finessed it uh, for the rest of the eighth grade. But by ninth grade, it, it was that, you know, they were, by the end of the eighth grade year, they were telling me that, you know, next, next, ninth grade, you know, counts more, it's high school. And, uh, you know, we're, you know, none of this nonsense anymore. Remember, somebody said, you're not going to be able to get away with this anymore. Like, really, we're getting away with something? <laughs> I thought we were just surviving. And um, so it was, it, it, it was, it was problematic. What, what helped us uh, the most? Well, she, as she started to get a little bit better, she was still in pain, she was still in the wheelchair. But her brain was a little clearer. There were various things, treatments and whatever that we had gone through. And it, so we started doing some online stuff ourselves. But at that time, again, you know, to mid, mid 2000s, they were just starting to get online stuff. And our school didn't really offer that. Our district didn't really offer that. There were other things and we found a program that um, at that time, I'm, I'm assuning they still have it. I don't know if they do. Uh, Brigham Young University had uh, an online program and you could, you could sign up for a class and have up to a year to finish it. Mm -hmm. And when some of the other options put um, time constraints on it. And so we started doing a few of those classes and she was doing, she was doing okay. And when I was telling the school that we were doing that, they were very threatened by that. And it was like, well, oh, you know, online, what is this online stuff? <laughs> and anyway, eventually what helped her was she got treated, she got better, she could go to school. And and so she she ended up graduating. She she went through our our district actually has a very nice independent study school mm. where she went when she was capable of doing that. She wasn't capable of doing that before, and so she did graduate on time with her you know with her classmates. But there was an there was an uncomfortable period in there. Yeah, very good. I'm just kind of curious, Rachel, before I ask you the next question, what kind of a student are you? A math, English, history? What was some of the science or some of the subjects that you really were attuned to? Oh, I always loved writing. I like, I loved writing if they would say, you know, write like just whatever you want to write. I don't want you to tell me what to write, but if I can just go, I always loved writing. So I, no, I, I kind of ran in the family with my mom being an author. 
I would imagine so writing a 500 word journal, you know, 500 <laughs> yeah. page, 500 page journal. Yeah. So good for you. Uh, you know, so as you read the book again, finding resilience, a teen's journey through Lyme disease, uh, you were very, we use words like vulnerable and authentic. And, you know, you talked about the depression that you went through. So tell us, uh, Tell us about that during your teenage years. And how do you look back on that? You know, when you reflect back on how it was going through that, uh, give us some insights. Yeah, so um, I was, I was, I mean, at first we didn't know what was happening. And although I was upset before I was hospitalized for five weeks at a children's hospital, before that, we just kind of didn't really know what was going on and I didn't like it, but I was okay. Then I went into the hospital where they really drilled in that it was, I was making it up and nothing like, I just needed to stop doing that so that I could get better and then I could get back to my life. And so it was in that hospital that we, I really, there was a huge shift from going into the hospital with hope that these people were gonna get me better. And then five weeks later, so depressed and it just kept getting worse and worse. And then once we started Lyme treatment, it like really exploded. Um, and so I was, very depressed for many years. I was on medication, which thankfully that was, that was helpful um, to a certain extent, but yeah, I really, I really struggled with that. And I mean, I know a lot of people with Lyme struggle with depression, but mine was also infused with a lot of trauma of, of medical, important medical people just telling me that you're making it up. 13 year old who's coming to you for help and then being told that it's, it's her fault. And so that, and yeah, that was fault. hard. And her mother's fault. It was both. Yeah. Well, let's talk about that before I ask a couple of final questions. Uh, you know, Dorothy, uh, on Lyme disease.org, well, actually a study just came out recently uh, from Lamar University about uh, Lyme patients who have been gaslighted. Uh, of course, Rachel was dramatically disserviced by the medical profession. And like you just said, Rachel, a 13 year old girl being told that this is in your head, that's got to be insane to kind of go through that. Uh, Dorothy, tell us what, you touched on this in, uh, before, but let's get a little more detailed. Tell us what that was like at the time. Uh, looking back, you know, how do you feel? And again, like I mentioned before, you know, you run, you're the president of LymeDisease.org that helps Lyme survivors get supported and brings out things like this. And you've, you've written numerous times and have published numerous articles about that whole concept of gaslighting, if you will. How do you view the medical profession from that angle right now, being with what you had gone through? Well, I think uh, they are taught, I think that generally doctors are taught, you know, certain ways of looking at things and in, in medical school and, and beyond uh, and they, I think it's, it's a challenge for them to, to see outside of what their training has been. And the training for relative to Lyme disease has been abysmal. And it's so, so that's, you know, so that's, that's part of it. I mean, one of the things is, is Lyme disease can cause things in your brain to make you so i mean that part of it is in your head <laughs> but but that's not what they mean when they say when they say it's in your head and so i just think that there is i think there has been starting to be in recent years now dr bransfield and others uh came out with a big study recently uh of mm -hmm. just not just lyme disease all of the different they call it uh, microbes and oh, mental yes. illness. All, all of the different things, you know, syphilis, and you know, my my mind's going blank now. But <laughs> there's 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 a whole lot of things that can cause psycho, you know, psychiatric changes because the actual disease, and so that's part of the picture. And the other part of it is is how you're treated, <laughs> and it's. One of the things that that I do in 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 my advocacy is that it's very important to me to provide information to people that need it. And that's, you know, that, you know, you've done a number of, of guest blogs for us. We have guests. We try to get different perspectives and different different kinds of information out there and and people people need to know people need to know because Otherwise, you know, if you have um, 
you know, some other kind of now, now, of course, with <laughs> with COVID, that that hasn't always worked so well. <laughs> but I was in the in the past, if you had some kind of a cons of a condition, you went to your doctor, they told you what it was, and you just accepted that, and you did what they said or you didn't, but you moved on. And so now there really is becoming to be more of an awareness. COVID really led the way to yeah. the, the new level of awareness that COVID and Lyme disease and fibromyalgia and chronic ME-CFS, chronic fatigue syndrome and others cause a whole lot of symptoms that are hard to pin down. And, and you know, one of the things about, about Lyme disease is that it tends to, it often has migrating pain. So someday, you know, one day one arm hurts and the next day the other arm hurts and the doctors use can use that as an excuse to show you that you're not consistent. See, you're making it up. Yesterday you said it was the other arm. Well, yesterday it was the other arm. <laughs> and it's just, um, there, there is a new awareness of that kind of thing. And so yeah. I am hopeful. I am hopeful that we're going to be able to get everybody back on track on for a lot of these things, because unfortunately with Lyme disease, uh, the mainstream, you know, medical world has been, has been off track. I can't tell you, you know, it wasn't just us that was told there's no Lyme around here, you mm -hmm. know, in California, there are parts of California that have as high a tick positivity rating as Connecticut, but California is a big state. And so they, they, uh, you know, what's, what's the word I'm wanting? You know, they, they, they average it out, they average mm -hmm. it out and they say, Oh no, 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 no ticks here. <laughs> and so it's, uh, anyway. Yeah. I appreciate that. You know, before I ask you for your final thoughts, Rachel, how are you today? So how big a part of your life uh, is Lyme disease and treating yourself for Lyme disease? Yes, um, I'm doing really well today. Actually, in, uh, next week, a week from today, I'm going to do a, uh, my first snowboarding class. So I'm very excited about that to learn to snowboard. So I'm doing very well. Uh, something in terms of how Lyme still affects me. Uh, it's something I have to stay on top of and I'm not specifically treating it right now, but I have to always be on top of it. Like if I get the flu or get something, I I make sure that like to get nutritional IVs and, and do anything I need to do so that that does not become an opportunity for the Lyme to kind of jump on it. Um, so that's something that we always be mindful of, but I'm doing really well and I'm very grateful for that. That's great. Before I ask you both one final question, I just want to acknowledge you both again, Dorothy, you've been on the show before and um, you know, you've been so helpful to millions of people with the work you've done, uh, you know, through Lyme disease.org and your advocacy and uh, you know, your blogs that you post out there independently. And Rachel, I just want to acknowledge you for the, um, for the, I've, I've used the word vulnerability and authenticity before, but the courage right? You know, the courage in telling this story, there's a lot of people who I've met who are, I hate to use the word, but ashamed that they have Lyme disease because it's such a misunderstood disease, right? And because it's been, as we use the word gaslighted before, and because most people don't understand it, you know, hopefully your book uh, will reach people who will understand that it's, it's a disease that happens. And this is what happens when you get it as you're, if you're a teenager or whatever, and this is what it feels like. And this is what um, you could use from other people, family, friends, whatever to recover. So I just want to acknowledge you both for your bravery, your courage, and for the service that you provide to millions of people. Uh, Dorothy, final question for you. Many parents, again, are distraught when their child gets Lyme disease. Again, you wrote two books now, uh, but what is your, briefly, what is your general advice to a parent who finds out that their teenage son or daughter has Lyme disease? Well, I think it's important to, to listen to your child, hear, hear what they're saying, acknowledge it, validate it, 
and uh, and it's important to do research about it and not necessarily take the first thing that you're told by the first the first doctor that you see. And um, it's just information in, in you know in, in, in information is just just critically important and it's there there's actually uh, there's a lot of good books out there, not not just ours. <laughs> There's a lot of there's a lot of good books, and um, you know my my other piece of advice is for people to sign up to get weekly emails from LymeDisease.org. Go to the website; it's on the main page. Sign up for our newsletter, and we you know send it free to your email every week. Find out what the latest is. Yeah, great. It's a great service. Uh, Rachel, so in conclusion here, uh, what is your advice for family members, partners, and friends who love a chronic Lyme survivor? Well, like my mom said, I can number one is believe because that is something that until you are not believed for telling your truth or when you're telling your truth, um, something you just can't fathom how hard that is. So believe the, no matter what, just believe your kid or your loved one. Um, and then also I have found it is very important to do things that bring you joy. And there are so many things out. When I was super sick, I would sit in my in my hospital bed and I had my computer on a hospital table, my keyboard and mouse on my lap, and I would edit videos and that brought me joy. And so I highly recommend for families uh, and caregivers and loved ones to be able to try to help their, um, their sick loved one find something that brings them joy because that can help get you through. Yeah, that's great. You know, as Dorothy knows, the, the forward of my book was written by Dr. Richard Horwitz. And his last line in the forward was, um, you know, there is hope with love and proper medical treatment. So once again, I want to thank Dorothy Leland. I want to thank Rachel Leland. My name is Fred Diamond, and this is the Love Hope Lime podcast.